There is no history without us. History, as an account of the past, depends upon us, in the present, to ask questions, to pay attention to certain details, to decide what to look at. But can we get in the way of genuine understanding? The past is a foreign country. So said the British writer L.P. Hartley, meaning it is different to us. It is strange. Just as a stranger unfamiliar with a land and its customs can get confused when visiting can misinterpret or misunderstand that land. So also, our own native customs, our own experience of what is normal or expected, of what is in our home country, in our present, can be obstacles to understanding when we visit the past. Consider an analogy. Archaeologists study ancient past cultures and civilizations. They do this by digging through layers. Archaeologists have to be careful to distinguish the layers of historical deposits. If they were to confuse a higher and later layer, with what came before the deeper layers, they would get a very confused picture of the past. In the same way, we get confused when we mix up our topsoil layer with the deep layers below it. Historical knowing involves a kind of unknowing, putting to the side the normativity of our time and place. To recognize what historians call the historicity of our normal and normative categories. By that they mean that what is normal and normative in our setting, including our beliefs and values, is particular to that setting and not universal. We need to work to unknow aspects of our present so that we can see past contexts in their own settings. When we look at the 16th century Reformation movements, what do we have to unknow? One category is our denominational lens. The categories Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, Presbyterian, and so on. These can distort our view of 16th century Europe if we impose our present experience on a different world, a social world in which everyone was Catholic. There are some exceptions to that statement, but by and large the territories of Western Europe that were the seedbeds of religious change were officially Christian, and the only form of Christianity was Catholic Christianity. Those who clamored for religious reforms, by and large, were not seeking to be anything other than Catholic. They did not form denominations. The dominant view among them was that there was only one 
true and universal church. They were seeking to be that church. But they had very different understandings of what that single, holy, Catholic church was or should be. The denominational idea is only one of the later categories of experience that we can wrongly impose on the early modern period. There are many others. The modern idea of individual choice over belief and practice, modern individualism, is another. The idea that church and government ought to be separate is another category. The ideas of tolerance and pluralism. What can be confusing in this is that all these ideas can be argued to have some very early origins or anticipations precisely in the reform movements of the 16th century. But there is a vast difference between a time when the soil was being prepared for the sowing of seeds and the process of germination, sprouting, growth, budding, and flowering. To see and to appreciate each context as distinct and different is part of the art of thinking historically.